You know, since we are talking about the economy, my next question to you will be that: Will the world move from capitalism to responsible capitalism, or will it move to socialism? It's a thought that we are all pondering over as we watch everything unfold around us. Sustainability and rapid economic growth haven't historically gone hand in hand. Reducing carbon footprint, addressing climate change, which also will mean that we need to slow down our consumption and reimagine our economies. But one fears that this might also lead to huge job cuts and a big job crisis all over the world. What can governments around the world do collectively and individually to balance this? Well, uh, <laughs> that will need a whole paper. <laughs> that question is a very <laughs> uh, well. Essentially, let me talk about India. uh in india still 60 to 62% of the world's country's population is in agriculture so that is a huge safety net because the monsoons are expected to be good this year if we focus on agricultural production one important thing is nobody will die of starvation that's a basic concern for me as long as people are nourished maybe will uh, people will buy less of your clothes will uh, buy less of everything that doesn't matter but every nobody is dying of starvation everybody is well nourished well nourished human beings with time on their hands can be very productive they can come up with something tremendous something absolutely new that we have not done till now so 60% is there that is a safety net and because 60% is involved in agriculture and now a whole lot of people from cities have kind of reverse migrated back to uh, villages both agriculture and textile could take off in a big way because 45 million people in this country are employed in textile uh, industry and this was our real strength at one time we have so much uh, population ag agriculture mainly because many of the weavers went back to agriculture for survival after the east india company came and destroyed systematically destroyed our industry uh, mainly textile industry at one time we are clothing the whole of europe most valued cloth came from this country we can again get the nation back there because the values of sustainability are slowly not only in the high society it is slowly dripping down to middle class so there that that size of that sustainable market is gradually improving i think uh, month on month it is kind of expanding so because of that we have an immense possibility in this country agriculture and textiles and of course there are many other allied things which can be done but for the rest of the world those who are completely running on uh, you know there are economies which are running only on purchasing power of the people so there there will be uh, serious dislocations what they will do we have to see because always it's been about putting money in people's hands and they will buy something and this rotation has been going on and all the time people are getting into deeper and deeper debts and they're buying more and more endlessly fueling this consumption those economies will be hit i think a large part of world economy has moved in that direction so that part will be hit in my opinion if i could be completely wrong i am a, not a economist or something i'm just gauging from people's moods and how they are and how things are happening let's say 12 months if this virus situation continues i would say maybe we will have to live like how we lived here about 20 years ago 15 or 20 years ago when i say 20 years ago in the last decade people tell me because you are i mean i am not just aiming at the textiles but because you are in that you understand those volumes better than anything else uh they are saying we are buying five times more clothing than our grandparents and in the next five years they are saying we are going to double that that means 10 times we will have well only one pair we can wear at any time we like style we like variety all right we can do all that but uh, an endless amount of consumption of anything textile is not the only thing uh, these days uh, people are buying phones every 6 months whether it is uh, working or not working well you know things which are in good functioning mode they are throwing it away and buying another thing and another thing simply because it's become a statement this is the way they try to enhance their individual nature which is a very basic way of living that human being has to enhance himself or herself only because of what they possess 
is a very, very unfortunate way to live. So that dimension, probably most people will begin to realize if we suddenly start living like how we were 20 years ago. It was not bad 20 years ago, as far as I can remember, <laughs> not bad at all. Maybe we had much less than what we have today, but I think it's perfectly okay. So one thing that every nation should focus on is agricultural production, because people should not starve. There must be food in the every nation. If this one thing is taken care of, if we roll back a little bit with all the technologies that we have in the last 20 years, the advancement of technology, communication especially, especially see from uh, Coimbatore to Kolkata, we are talking right now. With all this, if our consumption, consumption reduces, not because of our wisdom, simply because our pockets are shallow, I don't think it's a very bad thing. My only concern is people should not go into starvation mode. I think in this country, we are well endowed in that direction. Every other nation also should prepare for that. Thank you. It's very well said because I really think that what the lockdown taught many of us was to appreciate the basics. And I think, you know, uh, there is a saying in Bengali that we sometimes look at your which means that we sometimes focus more on the periphery than on the core. But I think for India, the lesson is... Not that, you know, sometimes, food, all the time, most people. <laughs> yes. so the core food first on the table, human lives first. Fashion can come much later. You know, no, Sadhguru, you, can do, you can do style with very little things. Absolutely. <laughs> See, even, even a thousand years ago, those who were stylish were stylish, isn't it? Right. Even the Sadhguru, caveman, just with Sadhguru, his loincloth also, he did his own style. <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> you know, you were talking about nourishment, and I want to ask you something about wellness. They are both related. Even before the pandemic, the topic of wellness had become very popular all over the world. I view its rise in popularity as a direct response to the effects of excessive capitalism. People feel overworked, tired. I mean, I haven't slept well for the last 10 years because I was, all, I was constantly on a work treadmill. And now people are looking for new ways to slow down. They are understanding how beautiful life can be and they want to all achieve a better quality of life. Tell us a little more about the importance of wellness in the modern world and what kind of a role would India play in it? I would like to dealing these two things. Slow life is well-being. I don't think so. Even in a very fast lane, you can still be well. I'm always on a fast lane, but I'm very well. So wellness and lazy life need not necessarily be connected. You could be working very hard and still be very well, because the question is only, are, uh, are you, uh, is your life an expression of your joy? Or are you working in pursuit of your happiness? That makes all the difference. If, you're, if your work and if your activity is an expression of your joyfulness, then uh, work is not going to deplete you. It only enhances you. So Don't. I would like to, first of all, dis dealing those two things. Well, for many of them who are just started working for a living, many people, they got a job mainly to make a living. But then they got mad about their job and endlessly they went on. Such people are suffering their jobs. In United States of America, they tell me, 70% of the population, some surveys say, not, not like their work. They hate their work. So we, when we were looking at why are so many drug overdoses are happening in the weekends, you know, one, one uh, Saturday evening in Ohio, in a small town uh, near uh, Dayton, I think, Dayton, Ohio, 23 cars were found where people were lying, overdosed, that they won't wake up, they need hospital to wake up, that kind of people, not just drunk or drugged. They have drugged to that point where they need a hospital to bring them back. 23 in the cars, they sit somewhere in the parking lots here, there, and they go into these states. So we were looking at why is it people... Saturday evening means they have to go crazy. Actually, it's Friday. Thank God it's Friday, you know, that whole concept. <laughs> so when we were looking at it, we found that 70% of the Americans hate their work. When five days of the week you do something that you hate, oh my God, you will want to go away from this world. So in a way, a drug or uh, excessive alcohol, all these are a way of going away from this world. Weekend is not a rest time. Weekend is a way to obliterate yourself because five days of the week you're doing something that you don't care for. 
So this is a time for people to realize that how life, how precious this life is. Because as you sit here, as it is ticking off moment to moment, it's not a second or a minute that's going away. It's your life that is ticking away. When you realize this, and uh, th this is very important in this culture, we always, from childhood, we always made people conscious that this is mortal life. You are mortal, that means you are on a limited lease of time. If you understand this every moment, at least making use of this lockdown, if people understand we are mortal, we have very little time to live, as we sit here, our life is just ticking away. If we know this, I think naturally people will do what matters most to them. If every human being is doing what really, really matters to that human being, I think we have a beautiful world. Absolutely. I think it's also time for everybody to reprioritize. Because I see the same thing in, in the business that I'm in, that a lot of people are so unhappy doing what they want to do. And I think they need to be aligned back to what they really want from their life. Mm -hmm. Anyway, coming back to fashion and beauty, the fashion and the beauty industry for the longest time have preyed on people's insecurities to increase their bank balance. We are constantly telling people to become better versions of themselves. Sometimes so much so that we alienate people from who they really are. We are constantly trying to make them look different from who they are, change their personalities. I don't personally think it's a very sustainable business model. I've said this in many interviews. Uh, I just want to ask you, what are your thoughts on the fashion and the beauty industry? And how do you think that fashion and beauty together can contribute to a much more sustainable and a positive dialogue that's going to create wellness in society? By fashion, you mean just clothes, accessories and stuff, not uh, cosmetic surgery, right? Everything, sir. Fashion and, and in, beauty. Together. Including cosmetic surgery. Cosmetic surgery. In, in many ways, when you look at clothing, I, I think that sometimes the fashion industry, what we do is we are constantly trying people to adapt to newer clothing that they are not comfortable with. I, I, I might not say it's a, it's a cosmetic change, but it definitely is a change. So I wanted to ask you, how is it that we can realign people to who they really are, still create a business, and create more wellness and less anxiety in the in the world. I was uh, I was talking to a a very a senior lawyer in the United States. Uh, she's she's a vice president in the company, and this company is the second largest law firm in the United States. It's a very senior position, but she's uh, only in her late forties. A brilliant lawyer. But I was staying with them and uh, I just saw how she has to get ready in the morning, walk up and down, take calls on high heels and tight clothes and struggling. I said, isn't it so hard to be a woman? Why is it, why have you made it so extremely hard to be a woman? I have seen my mother, my aunts and my, you know, many other, other women around me who are uh, very comfortable the way they are, dressed the way they are. Uh, the way they make, make themselves up is very easy. But the way uh, certain fashion, uh, what to say, concepts have made them is, it's so extremely difficult to be a woman constantly walking on stilts and, you know, all that problems, uh, the tightness of the clothes, yeah, you can't sit, you can't stand, everything is difficult. So in a way, trying to fit people into male needs, especially women, because fashion means largely it's been a woman's domain, slowly men are coming into the picture, but still I think it's a small number if I'm right. Uh, so uh, I think uh, the entire fashion industry for a long time has been trying to fit a woman into a male requirement. I think you should fit a woman into a woman's requirement of what she wants to be, rather than how a man wants her to look. So, uh, I think if that change happens, a whole lot of things in the world will change. And uh, if a woman dresses the way it is comfortable and nice for her, rather than how it is nice for a man to look at, if that is done, I think uh, many things about how women will come out in the society, how they will function, how will they will succeed in various aspects of life, all these things could change significantly if only fashion is not, women's fashion is not defi defined by male requirements. Well, males, men's fashion, I don't think it is defined by women's requirement. I think it's largely by the male requirement, so I don't think there's any change needed there. But uh, above all, 
being comfortable with what you wear and uh, just everybody as uh, you know like uh, even a bird grows uh, colored feathers to make itself attractive so it is the nature of uh, lives on this planet to wanting to look better than what it is little enhancement of who they are it's perfectly fine it's not uh, it's not something for me to comment upon but uh going overboard in terms of killing all your comfort your well being everything just to look in a particular way i think this has to go i think you've done a lot in this direction to bring back uh, you know organic clothing where naturally the comfort in this kind of tropical nation organic clothing is so very comfortable most people don't know what that is and hope uh, right now this uh, whatever uh, people are protesting against the chinese police uh, so with this i hope little more handlooms and organic cottons and silks in, in this country will grow because uh, it looks like there's going to be a big movement in that direction so the comfort of being in a in a in a in a cloth that's been produced with care with a certain involvement more than anything somebody who loves to do it does it i am not saying the cloth will be dripping with his love or what that's not the point the point is what human beings have contributed to must uh, must come to you and stay close to you not something that just falls out of a machine like that that mass production idea has uh, gone into textiles started with manchester <laughs> and uh, it's okay if you're producing steel nuggets you can produce mass produce but clothing which is so intimate to a human being must be hand produced as much as possible if not completely education must become a uh, designer you know right now we have mass education like a extruder it is dropping children out in one shape whatever happens to that individual it doesn't matter you got him into the shape that you want so fashion should not be in that context that you got somebody into the shape that you want no it must be the way it will enhance that person at the same time enhance not just in appearance in comfort in well being in every sense it should enhance that person thank you you know in fashion we have a new movement that's coming up which is called the female gaze you're so right because fashion has been dominated by male designers for the longest time but right now spectacular pieces of women's wear is being created by women designers in fact in my company 90% of the women 90% of the people who are holding top position are women and i specifically choose women without being sexist it's just a strategy because i think women understand women's clothing and their needs and their bodies more and it helps us to understand women from a female gaze which is so important it's happening in photography it's happening in advertising it's happening in fashion and you're so right thank you so much i that's have another question moment. that's a good moment that's a good direction to go <laughs> yeah there you know as a man we can only assume what it is to be a woman we can never be a woman so it's always important to take the direction from a woman we are dressing up a woman it's so important there is a shift recently there's a shift in fashion towards sustainability and i wanted to ask you about your work with the isha foundation you all have started something called fashion for peace which i was a small part of in new york i wanted to know more about what you are doing with sustainability what you are doing with fashion for peace what is your intention and where you are taking this movement we connected uh, some of the new york uh, fashion designers um, american designers and some indian ones i mean indian origin uh, people with the local uh, clusters of uh, weavers and you know cloth makers so that connection we are making and now we are trying to uh, this is in the works but it's taken longer than we thought it would we want to create some kind of a textile exchange about uh, handmade cloth and those in different parts of the world who are willing to use it uh, this is not a business venture it's more like a social venture where this exchange will link people up and even stock up some things and uh, you know uh, transportation and other things which they are not able to handle even to dispatch a little bit of goods they don't know what to do uh, to create those kind of clusters as a, a more like a social activity rather than a commercial activity but i feel uh, apart from us somebody must take it up as a commercial activity then only it will become much larger 
we are doing it more as a setting up a model for people to do it in much bigger scale on the social level we cannot scale up because there is no profit uh, margin so scaling up becomes a difficult process for us that's what we are right now at thank you